He is considered one of the greatest heroes of the War of 1812. His statue towers over the Niagara River, still pointing at his adversaries. Universities, even churches, still bear the name of Major General Sir Isaac Brock. There's an Anglican church in the village of Queenston that's called St. Saviour's. And the Saviour is not Christ. The Saviour is Brock. Yet before the war is six months old, he is dead. In just two battles, this leader forged alliances so crucial and gained victories so audacious, he became more than a man. He became a legend. Today, peaceful relations between Canada and the United States are taken for granted. Yet this relationship would not exist without events that transpired two centuries ago on the same land, but in a very different world. In 1812, the United States is a young country of just seven million. Detroit is the end of the earth. The First Nations are powerful, as feared as they are respected. The remote British outpost known as Upper Canada is commanded by a soldier named Isaac Brock, a warrior without a war. In Europe, Bonaparte threatens the British Empire, yet I'm stuck here without a chance for glory or fame. That is about to change. In 1812, war between Britain and the United States seems inevitable. The Americans want Britain out of North America, in part because the British seize sailors from U.S. ships and force them to serve in the British Navy. Some of them were, were Royal Navy deserters. Others were simply British-born, people with English, Irish, Scots, Welsh accents who maybe had emigrated to the United States. Some 7,000 sailors were taken from American ships, so it was a fairly large problem. The British used the sailors to feed their war against Napoleon. They also refused to accept that anyone can ever forsake the duties of a British subject. The Americans think this is a slap in the face of their newfound sovereignty. One former president brashly predicts a war in Canada will be easy to win. Thomas Jefferson, he said that the capture of Canada, at least as far as Quebec, would be nothing but a mere matter of marching. Isaac Brock fears Jefferson could be right. Canada is filled with recent immigrants from the United States. They've signed an oath of allegiance to his majesty, but will they fight their former countrymen? The majority of Upper Canadians were American-born. Would they pick up arms and fight against their former countrymen? Brock has a plan to defend Upper Canada, and it suits his ambition to be in the fight. I must see service, or quit the army altogether. Brock seems to have felt that he was kind of being left out of where the main action was. He was very interested in getting promoted and getting promoted rapidly. But the odds are against Brock. He has only 2,000 trained soldiers and a handful of volunteer militia to defend the entire frontier. Brock's superior, Sir George Prevost, counsels caution. General Prevost is a good man. He does not wish to gamble his forces on an attack on the Americans. But fortune favors the bold. The British plan through the whole war was to get the Americans to the negotiating table to end the war. Although the British continue to hope for peace, comments from the American president, James Madison, make it clear to Brock that war is coming. My dear brothers, there is no mistaking it. President Madison's speech smells of gunpowder. We should prepare for war. 
Brock had a lot to do, but he knew it was only a matter of time before the United States would declare war on Britain and that British North America would become a target. Sensing the inevitable, Prevost orders Brock to seek allies among the local Aboriginal peoples. Native alliances for the British forces in, in uh, British North America were important. They could compensate for the fact that they had too few troops. Sir, as it is probable that war may result from the present state of affairs, it is very desirable to ascertain the degree of cooperation that you and your friends might be able to furnish. This is Fort St. Joseph. These ruins once housed a crucial British fur trading and military outpost near the shores of Lake Huron. It is also just four hours by canoe from Brock's first target, the American Fort Mackinac in Michigan. One of Brock's letters reaches this crucial location and a plan is set in motion. Our forces should gather with our Indian friends here at Fort St. Joseph. Their objective is here at Fort Mackinac. Brock believes a victory at Mackinac is essential to creating a First Nations alliance. This would show that even at the most distant American post, the British could overpower the Americans, and therefore the British were likely to win the war. On June 18, 1812, the United States declares war. Brock is ready. On July 15th, a small company of British infantry and 300 native warriors leave Fort St. Joseph. They land at Mackinac just before dawn. Our assault party knew exactly where to attack. Our fur trading allies had been there many times. Mackinac Island is small, but that makes it easier to defend. There are steep cliffs more than 100 feet high. An approach from the lake is foolish. The steep embankment protects the fort. Instead, the British drag two cannons through the bush. On the heights behind the fort, the guns are aimed at the American magazine, filled with gunpowder. The British send a messenger to the fort. The Americans surrender immediately. Brock's army has the first victory of the war. Not a single shot is fired. But how is such a stunning outcome even possible? Our first victory was without bloodshed, with good reason. The young American commander did not know his country was at war. I think that the First Nations were impressed the British showed that they had enough power to overwhelm the Americans. But Brock knows he'll need to do more to convince the local Aboriginals to stay on side. We took the Americans by surprise at Mackinac. Our next challenge will be more confrontation. less than a month old, and the British have their first victory. Fort Mackinac was a stunning win against a commander who didn't even know he was at war. Isaac Brock's next target is much better defended, the American stronghold at Fort Detroit. Do not fear the Yankee army. The militia is composed mostly of enraged Democrats. Oh, they're more ardent and anxious to engage than the regulars, but they lack discipline. They die very fast. The American regular army was small. At the outset of war, they increased the number in the regular army, but these were just recruiting guys off the street, very little training, not even fully equipped. Brock believed the province could actually be held by the proper positioning of troops, by un the undertaking of limited offensive action against the Americans at key points, and by securing alliances with the natives. Taking Fort Detroit will impress the First Nations, 
It is a crucial military base on the river. It also has weak leadership under the command of General William Hull, an aging 59-year-old veteran of the American Revolution. I think Hull was a good peacetime general, but uh, didn't have the experience, the training, the gumption, or whatever it was to be a good wartime general. Hull makes some poor decisions, among them sharing his greatest fears in his letters and shipping them on open water. My men captured a packet of letters from Hull. The general's letters were interesting. He dramatically overestimated the size of my force. But the private letters from his officers were devastating. They showed me that Hull was weak, afraid to make decisions, and I discovered his greatest fear. Indians. The revelation adds urgency to Brock's negotiations with the First Nations, including a charismatic Shawnee chief named Tecumseh. It was late on the evening of August 14th when I first laid eyes on him. In the flickering light of the lanterns, I saw before me a tall man with a singular intensity of gaze. Tecumseh's dream is to unify the native tribes against American expansion and create their own nation. And he is impressed with Brock. This is a man, he would later say. Brock is impressed too. Tecumseh, I think, was extremely good at kind of uh, bridging the gap between First Nations cultures and, and European cultures. Brock has only a 1,000 men. The aboriginals bring 500 more. Hull's forces outnumber them by a 1,000, and they are well protected inside the fort. Something bold, unusual, is needed. My officers didn't like the plan, but Tecumseh did. Brock's plan is a daring bluff. He will try to trick the Americans into overestimating British numbers. It's an audacious plan. But years before, Brock proved he's no stranger to the art of the bluff. As the story goes, uh, this chap challenged Brock to a duel. And if you're challenged to a duel, you get to choose the weapons and choose the circumstances of the duel. The challenger was infamous. Bully and a braggart, but a very good shot. I accepted the challenge, so I set the terms. I chose pistols. But rather than marking 12 paces before turning to fire, my terms required that my opponent and I exchange fire across the distance of a handkerchief. He had to back down. He had no choice but to resign from the unit. I think it shows that Brock was very smart. If Brock could bluff the bully, uh, then the bully would back down. At Fort Detroit, Brock relies on a bluff once again. Knowing he's outnumbered, Brock instructs inexperienced volunteer militiamen to don the red coats of army regulars. This makes it appear that his troops are better trained. Then Tecumseh joins the game. Tecumseh's tactics are brilliant. He marches his men single file in plain sight of Fort Detroit, in plain sight for the enemy to see. Then the braves cut back through the woods to pass by a second, and indeed a third time, to deceive the enemy as to our numbers. The ruse works. Hall believes he is facing a vastly superior force, one filled with the natives he fears. The British fire a single cannonball. Then Brock demands Hull surrender. Major General Brock to Brigadier General Hull, headquarters, Sandwich, August 15th, 1812. Sir, the force at my disposal authorizes me to require of you the immediate surrender of Fort Detroit. 
Once Brock realized that Hall didn't have an awful lot of experience with First Nations, realized that he could really play that fear that a lot of North Americans had of First Nations warfare. It is far from my intention to join in a war of extermination. But you must be aware that the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond control the moment the contest commences. The American general panics. There were reports of political and military opponents of his. He was seen cowering in a corner, had too much to drink, spittle running down his face, drooling, and, and that's just a man in absolute utmost terror. Legend has it that Hull was so anxious to surrender, he hung a tablecloth from a window against the wishes of his men. I think that uh, if the Americans had have had someone who could really inspire the troops, he could have obliterated Brock's army. Bonaparte once said, I like generals who are lucky. I admit to my share of luck. Brock's daring tactics have given him an important victory at Detroit. But Britain still hopes to avoid further conflict. They agree to stop seizing sailors from American ships. And Prevost calls for a truce. Brock was concerned that if war did break out again, then the ceasefire simply gave them time to build up their forces on the Niagara frontier. General Prevost's mistake could cost us dearly. My only option is to prepare for invasion. This is Fort George in Niagara, Isaac Brock's command center. In the fall of 1812, Brock is enduring a ceasefire his superiors hope will end the war. Brock has two victories already, but now he has to wait while his adversaries gather their army. All he can do is try to guess where the Americans will strike. Everybody knew the Americans were going to come. The question was when and where. Brock suspects the Americans will attack one of four key British positions. Fort Erie in the south, Chippewa, Queenston, a transportation hub on the portage route around Niagara Falls, or Fort George in the north. Brock had to try and determine as early as possible where the main target would be and get the most troops to that spot as quickly as possible. It was a difficult position. The cards were in the American court. Brock decides to station the majority of his troops at the British stronghold of Fort George. But Brock is wrong. On October 13th, he awakens to hear guns in the distance. So when the sound of the artillery reached Fort George, Brock leaps out of his bed and immediately heads south. The Americans have crossed the Niagara River and are attacking Queenston. Brock is more than 12 kilometers from the battle. Queenston was important because it was along the portage line that went around Niagara Falls. So if you were coming from Lake Ontario, you would come up the Niagara River, offload everything at Queenston, march south towards Chippewa, bypassing the falls, and reload everything on boats and carry on south to Lake Erie. So if the Americans had occupied that point, he'd be able to disrupt British communications. And if they could stay there through the winter, then hopefully undertake further operations. Near the crest of Queenston Heights, I saw one of our battery. Our cannon were laying fire on the enemy boats. Just as Brock arrives, the Redan battery has been captured by the Americans. It's a crucial British cannon position on the heights above the beach. He sees the fighting going on the beachhead expanding and the threat of the British being withdrawn from the beachhead. He or somebody orders the company that was protecting the artillery on the heights down in the village to deal with this battle on the beachhead. 
And just as that company comes down, the Americans on the Heights launch their attack. Brock wants a higher view of the battle. He climbs the hill, but a small group of Americans have followed a fishing path and gained the high ground behind the British at the Redan Battery, where an 18-pound cannon can lay waste to the town of Queenston. We have the bravery, but we have not the men to staunch a flow of enemy soldiers. At first, Brock and his men retreat. Then Brock makes a fateful decision. Brock was astute enough a military commander to know that that Redan battery position was key to the battle. Brock takes immediate action. He assembles what soldiers he can and leads a charge to recapture the Redan battery. Problem is, he's going uphill and he has to leap over several fences. He's leading troops that have been fighting for several hours. When he was right at the base of the Heights, an American infantryman stepped forward and fired a musket at him. Hit him in the heart, and that was it. This is the problem, because you have the commander-in-chief of the province, the man who's responsible for that entire province, basically taking on the job of a company commander. And he's killed as a result of that. British reinforcements arrive. The Americans are driven back. The British win the battle, just 17 men dead. One of them is Isaac Brock perhaps a victim of his own bold nature. But in 1812, Brock's sacrifice makes him a hero. The militia adored Brock and, and quickly uh, branded him the hero of Upper Canada. He seems to have been highly respected and regarded by First Nations allies as well. So I think Brock's real ability and, and real contribution was in his ability to pull these disparate elements together. Brock's actions echoed across Upper Canada. The lesson from 1812 was that Upper Canada could be defended. The Americans are smarting from three big losses. But in the coming year, their armies will cross the Niagara again. Thanks to Brock, Upper Canada is ready to stand its ground. They call me the savior of Upper Canada. Yet it is they who ultimately must save themselves. If I have done anything, it is to show them that they can make a difference in this conflict. The outcome is not preordained.